Hello, everyone. I see we have a few participants already. I was just in another, I was uh, testing this setup this morning. Um, this is a little different format. I'm usually at my desk sitting, but since I'm going to do a demonstration today, uh, I've got to show you some things. So hopefully you'll be able to see everything. It's a little tight with the webcam and, and everything, but um, welcome. It's nice to have you here. We'll, uh, we'll get going at right on the dot. I am going to put the chat up so I can see. Um, I don't have anyone monitoring the chat. Uh, maybe in the future I'll have an assistant join and help monitor the chat. I also don't intend to do um, Q&A with these sessions. These are kind of just in and done quickly. Pardon me while I just get this a little. I'm just fidgeting with the camera so that we get the best frame. No, that's not going to work. You've got to be able to see this. Okay, let's see. <laughs> the chair, my daughter's chair in the way, hang on. Okay, this will do. I may, I think I'm going to actually adjust the camera. Uh, hi, hi, Nancy. I see some faces, Keith. Um, some other people I don't know, so um, hello. <laughs> Um, so I, I won't be able to monitor the chat super well, but in the event that I need to move the camera down so that you can see, and I forget to do that, ping me in the chat because <laughs> I can't hear you. I don't have earbuds in and you guys are all muted. So ping me in the chat if you can't see or if the audio cuts out or anything happens and I'll just try to monitor that the best that I can. We'll, we'll do a little teamwork here. So, um, but I am excited that you've joined me. This is the second official week of this new um, tutorial plan. I did a test back in, I think it was in December, to see if people liked the 20 minute format. And, um, and they did. So I decided to do it on a weekly basis. So you are just welcome any week. I'm actually, I'm gonna hit record here. Oh, it's already recording. <laughs> okay. Um, so you are welcome to join any week. There's no RSVP needed. You don't have to even sign up for my emails. You're welcome to share it with others. The replay will remain up until Sunday. That will be the plan. Um, I'll keep the replays up until Sunday of the, that week. So if you want to subscribe to our YouTube channel, um, that would be great. Then you'll be able to see the replays and you'll get a notification when those come up. And then they'll go into a, a learning library for our members long term. So anyway, without further ado, welcome. Uh, I'm excited to teach this topic. So I had someone email me this past week and she basically asked, all right, I've got 40 years worth of photos. How am I ever going to get through this? And she was wondering about a one-on-one -on -one consultation. And I thought, I am going to teach this to everyone <laughs> because it's a topic that I've struggled with and spent years trying to figure out. And I have some methods that I want to share with you. Uh, and primarily today, I'm going to show you how I use a light box. Now, today's tutorial is just on the digitizing method. We're not going to get into uh, cropping, saving, editing photos, managing all of those photos. Those are all topics for a different day. <laughs> this is just the digitizing process. And uh, I will give you a couple of use case scenarios here of how this has become an issue for me. And I probably don't even need to explain this. My guess is you have a few tubs or bankers boxes full of photos, or maybe you have beautiful scrapbooks on your uh, shelves and they need to be digitized. Maybe who's gonna get the scrapbooks? Do you wanna tear them apart and give the individual photos to people? And also how you digitize books. So anyway, you may have your own reasons for being here today, but I'll share with you a couple of the things that have come along in my work and my business. So one of the first things that started happening is I started to do professional projects, um, especially for, these are like full book projects. Uh, clients would say to me, I have this tub of photos here, you deal with it. <laughs> these are people who often have more money than time and they just wanna have somebody make it go away. Um, you're probably in this class to do it yourself because you're not one of those people. Neither am I, I have to do it myself. Um, so, but anyway, I had to figure out fast how to deal with these tubs of things they were paying me to deal with. Um, and then another thing would happen and that was as I got doing more professional research projects, I would go up to the library, up to special collections and they'd start pulling folders for me or sometimes full bankers boxes 
And I would realize that I had to get through a ton of stuff fast. And if you don't, if you're not super efficient at getting what you need in that kind of environment, you'll find yourself having to go back again and again and again. And it's just really time consuming. So what I have learned is that the name of the game in a special collections library, or even maybe it's a local museum where your family may have had ties and you show up to get the books on the town, or I mean, any number of things that you might find in person that you can't get that's not digitized yet. You've got to get as much as humanly possible, as fast as humanly possible. And you really don't have time to sort through it all on the fly and know that you are, in other words, you don't have time to make judgment calls. It, it kind of becomes a matter of you've got to click, click, click and get it and then get home. So two more quick examples. Well, I'm going to give well, yeah, I'll decide how many examples I'm going to give, but I had a project out of town a while back where I had to physically drive, you know, half a day, stay overnight for a few days. I was presented with like five giant tubs of stuff that had been in the archives of this building for the last 60 years. We had a couple of interns and we had to get through it fast. So that was another example. I'll give one more example. <laughs> so I went to, I was working on this really amazing project um, to, it's a cultural landscape report for Pioneer Park in Salt Lake City. So this is the land where the pioneers first uh, built their fort. And so any of you who have Mormon pioneer ancestors, if they were part of the 1847 or 1848 wave, they lived on that land. So I did the research for that period. And uh, got in touch with a man, Randy Dixon, who is a professional historian for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And someone had told me he had some stuff and he said, oh, I have some stuff. Would you like to come get it? <laughs> He's retired now. And I said, would I? Although I have to tell you guys, careful what you wish for. <laughs> because I often find that the ancestors will call I get kind of out there about this stuff, but things that I need have a way of falling into my lap. And the giant boxes of things that have yet to be discovered have a way of making it to me. Um, but you can be, it can be a little overwhelming on the quantity. So case in point, I went to Randy's home with an intern and he brought out a banker's box, which didn't look too intimidating until I realized that this banker's box was full of his lifetime collection of research on this land. This was one of his pet projects. And every time a document crossed his desk at the church history library, he digitized it and carefully, meticulously organized it. I've never been given such a treasure trove of research perfectly organized. And it took an intern and I an entire day to digitize that banker's box because it was so meticulous and there was so much of it in that box. So had to get through it quick, um, ended up with something like 1400 pages um, of material, primary source research. Anyway, I'll go on and on about how exciting this stuff is, but you get the point. Let's get to the tutorial. <laughs> All right. So the way that I do this primarily, I also, well, I'll, I'll do a rabbit trail here. I also have a feed scanner. I use an I, a scan snap IX 500. This is one where you put in a stack of papers and it just goes ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. That's awesome if you have a stack of papers, but you often don't in this type of work. They're, it's usually mixed media. You'll have things like this. So here's a little like scrapbook that someone made, right? And it's so cute and beautiful, but how do you digitize that? I mean, it's awkward. You can't, it, these things are hard to run through a scanner. Um, you may have uh, heirlooms that you wanna take an, an image of. Maybe you have uh, boxes of photos. My, my, I keep touching my mic. Sorry if that sounds funny. Here's a folder. My mother recently passed away, and this was a folder of papers that I went through recently to digitize. So what I use in that case, so, okay, so I have a feed scanner for giant, for stacks of things. Um, I also use carrier sheets. These are like transparency sheets that you can put in smaller photos or torn pages, anything that you don't want to get uh, clogged in the feed scanner that works great for that. I also have a flatbed scanner on my printer. And then we have a high-end flatbed scanner for doing um, photo restoration. When I need something really high resolution, if I'm going to restore it or if something that I really want for a video, I will use my flatbed scanner for that. 
So the method today is for quantity. <laughs> this is quantity over quality. Now the quality is really quite remarkable, but it's not what I would, I wouldn't use this if I was going to publish a photo in a book, for example. So without further ado, let me introduce my little friend, the shot box. Um, disclaimer. Oh, well, this is usually the part, part, part where I say I make a commission on this. I do not make a commission at this time on the shot box. They don't pay me. I just really like these guys. Um, I bought one of these at a family history conference years ago and then wondered, was that a dumb purchase? But it has been one of the workhorses of my life and it was worth every penny and then some that I paid for it. So let me show you how I use this baby. Uh, okay, so I'm going to adjust the camera now so that you can see the box a little and it'll cut off the top of my head, but that's okay. You don't need to see the top of my head. <laughs> so this shot box is, it actually folds up. Uh, you, can you see my dog in the background? Hi, Lola. <laughs> this is my home office where my puppy, 11-year-old puppy, uh, sleeps with me, sleeps on the floor every day. So anyway, if you see Lola, that's who that is. So this is my light box. It folds up. Actually, I'm going to grab something real quick. I'm going to show you the neoprene case. So it comes in a case, at least we did a few years ago. They're set up maybe a little different, but it comes in a case. So you can take this with you to special collections. So it's super easy to bring with you. Or if you have to go to someone's home, I never like to be entrusted. I don't like people to give me things. I would rather do it on site so that I don't ever damage one of their photos. Oh my gosh. Let's turn my phone off. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so anyway, so you take it with you, you set it up, it just, you unfold it. It's really quick to set up. I don't need to show you that part. I just wanna show you the method here. So this light box, um, let me show you the entire box. So it is a box, you turn it on. And the beauty here is several fold. One is that it gives you perfect lighting. You can change the lighting settings a little. To, to eliminate glare, um, you can adjust it up or down, again, to eliminate glare. Glare is an issue anytime you're trying to take images. Um, and then you put your phone or your iPad on top of it right here. So there are several reasons why this is great. One is that it keeps your all of your images equidistant. So if you're doing a book, for example, so let's say I go to a library and there's this book that I can't get online or I don't want to buy. Uh, and I need to digitize a chapter. Well, it allows me to digitize page after page after page quickly and at exactly the same uh, distance apart. It also makes it flat so that it's not keystoned. <laughs> you can't even see my face at all. Sorry, let me <laughs> let's at least see my part of my face. Um, anyhow, so, um, so it keeps your photos flat. It keeps them from being shaky because you're not using your camera. It frees up your hands and it does it fast. So the way, the reason that it's fast is you turn on your phone like this, you go to your camera app, and then you just, you put your image down, you put your photo down, your book, and you just go click, and then you do the next page, and you go click, and you do the next page, and you go click. It's so much faster even, even than like a photocopy or even the, the fastest scanners are not as fast as this. I mean, again, you can get through 1400 pages in a day. Well, maybe with an intern. <laughs> um, so then when you get home, you take all these images and you can crop them, uh, export them, name them. You've got to deal with all this stuff when you get home. And again, that is a topic for another day. <laughs> but I want to show, so that's basically it. But I'm, there are a couple of um, best practices that I want to show you and a couple things that are cool about the shot box. One is that it comes with these backgrounds. You can see that this is a black background in here. It has these uh, like, uh, this is like neoprene. I don't know, not neoprene, it's, but it's soft. And it, so you can, there's one in white, green, black, and blue. At least my kit comes with that. So these go in the background so you can choose the background color that you like. And that way you get a nice, um, lovely, just kind of even background. Um, I mentioned that you can change the light settings. There's some other fancy settings we don't need to get into too much today. It has some glare reduction. Um, but I want to show you a couple of ways that I do this. I'll bring this back so you can see my face a little. <laughs> Thanks for your patience on this funny webcam setup. But anyhow, so uh, one is that it, the shot box does come, at least mine comes with a clicker so that you can uh, click instead of having to hit the button on your phone, 
um, you can you can do what is this called? There's a name for it that I is escaping me right now. Some of you want to say the name. I can tell it's a but it's a clicker. Um, yeah, it'll come to me after this is over. <laughs> But so the beauty of this is that it doesn't make, if you touch your camera, sometimes it makes it shake. See how I just wobbled that? Well, that's going to make a blurry image. So it's nice if you can use the clicker. It's driving me nuts what the word is. Anyway, if you use the clicker so that it doesn't shake your image. Also, it makes it so that one of the problems when you're trying to take pictures of things that are books or uneven sizes is you don't have enough hands. <laughs> you got to lay it flat with like your elbow and uh, another hand. And so it makes it much easier to hit click while you're using your hands to keep your image flat. But if you don't have a light box, you can still use this, this method with just a, a phone. I mean, you could go to special collections and just do this by holding your phone up. Trust me, you're going to want something to hold it steady. But I've done this many times, actually, when I was with an intern, I only had one light box and we were digitizing things at the same time. So we were using one phone without the light box and one with the light box. So you can do it without. And I want to show you a handy tip that a student one day told me about. If you have earbuds, these earphones that have a microphone on it, as they pretty much all do these days, if you click the button here, it'll take your image. So this will work as a clicker, as like a remote control clicker to um, to take your your images so you don't actually have to have one so if you're this is great for other kinds of photography as well so try that little tip um, that i was grateful that a student told me i was like ah oh, mind blown i had no idea it did that so now i want to show you a few of the extra things that are in my kit these are things that i take with me when i go to special collections um, that i've picked up over the years that you you may want so i this is a side note, I love gear. <laughs> I really do like fun tools that make your life a lot easier. So I'm gonna show you some of the things that have made the cut for my kit over time. Uh, the first thing that I keep in my kit all the time is a microfiber cloth, just a regular washcloth kind of thing, because you wanna be able to dust the um, any dust off of or hairs, anything that gets onto the um, the photo, especially if you're dealing with old documents, you're going to have a lot of little crumblies, uh, and you'll want to dust those away to keep your images nice and and clean. So keep a microfiber cloth in your kit all the time. Uh, make sure you keep a charger with you. <laughs> I've made this mistake more than once. I've gone to special collections and forgot to bring a charging cord. Or, and now I keep both a charging cord and a, um, a separate battery pack. It's just one of those separate battery packs because it takes a lot of battery juice to take images all day long. And if you're doing a lot, you're going to drain the battery on your phone. And you don't want to make a, a full day trip somewhere and find out that you're out of battery halfway through. I have made that mistake more than once, I'm sad to say. <laughs> so now I keep these things in my in my kit all the time. Because if I don't go very often, I forget the things that I need. Now, this one blew my mind. <laughs> I was at a special collections library once, and they had these little things that kind of look like shoelaces. And they are weighted. So it's, I, I bought this from Gaylord, Gaylord Archival or something. They do like professional archival products, really high-end, beautiful things for museums and and that sort of thing, but these are weights. So what you do, they're like snake weights, I think is what they call them. I should have looked up what they're called. But the purpose of this is to lay flat on your books and it will hold the pages of your books down without damaging the book. So remember when I said you don't have enough hands? Oh, <laughs> I can't tell you how much time I have wasted uh, because I was just trying to get the pages to lay flat and keep the image straight and keep my hands out of it. These little babies for the low, low price of something like, I don't know, maybe $20 is what I paid for them, will just save your bacon. Don't argue with me on this. Just go buy some. <laughs> you will be glad you did. So there's another piece in my kit. Uh, let's see. I wanted to show you. I, oh, it fell on the floor. <laughs> Doesn't help if you put these on the floor, but these are um, gloves. These are those like cloth gloves so that you don't damage and put fingerprints on your images so that when you're you're doing with your own photos or someone else's, you really should be wearing these gloves so that you don't 
get oils on your precious photos. So that's another item in my kit. Uh, this one, this is an inexpensive thing that I picked up. It's a jeweler's loop. I just bought this online um, so that this allows you to see, to magnify the pages. If you are working in microfilm, well, not microfilm, you'd be able to uh, expand that. But if you're working in old documents that are hard to read, uh, this is just, you really want a magnifying glass in your kit. Even if you have good eyes, you're going to need one. And this is just an easy little portable one. Um, although I inherited something from my mother that I wish I'd had years ago. And I'm going to show you this baby. My mom had this um, to help her read. It's a magnifying glass. It's like on a, uh, it has a light in it and it turns on and off and it has this magnifying screen screen. Oh, I can't tell you how many hours this saved me on the Pioneer Park project because I could read all of the, so all the documents that I digitized at Randy Dixon's house, uh, a lot of them were handwritten or they were small. I ended up printing them, a lot of them so that I could see. And then I used this to read them, <laughs> my eye, uh, to see the print. So th this was one I inherited and I wish I'd had years ago. So you may want to consider something like this if you're doing a lot of like historical work. Um, and that pretty much, oh, here's another fun one. Okay, there's one more little thing in here. Uh, this is this is a little bit instead of a jeweler's loop, it's a paperweight, but it's also a magnifying paperweight. <laughs> so you can put this down and just read, you could just slide it across the page and read one word at a time. So this is one for like four or five dollars you could pick up online, kind of a cute little, little paperweight that would um, help also with your uh, snake weights. So again, the reason why you would use a shot box or any light box would be if you have odd sized books. I use this for digitizing like this book that I recently was working on a project. You might digitize scrapbooks. You might digitize projects on site or large quantities of, of work. So that's it. Oh my gosh, we're right at 20 minutes after. Sometimes I go under, sometimes I go over, but we're pretty much on the dot today. So <laughs> I hope this was helpful. I hope it saves hours of your life. Uh, that's not, this is not the most fun part of the project. It's got to be done, but you, the fun part is digging in and seeing what's there. So, all right, join me for future lessons. I'll share more on how I, um, on how I, uh, like organize how my naming conventions cropping I don't always I'm looking for better methods but I have some some good things to share in the future so awesome thanks so much for joining over and out thank you